Hi, welcome back. In this set of lectures, we're talking about mechanism design. And the idea here is, is that we want to use models to help us how to design institutions and also how to think about which institution we might use. In this particular lecture, we're going to talk about auctions and how we auction things off. Now, auctions are used in a lot of settings. They're used to auction off airwaves, oil leases, and there's even things like wine auctions. Now, when you go to these auctions, sometimes they have ascending bids where people call out prices and you keep bidding until no one can bid anymore. Other times there's sealed bid auctions where you just write down an amount. There's a third type of auction we'll talk about as well called a second price auction which has a slightly more complicated set of rules. Now, when you auction something off your objective is to get as much money as you can possibly get. And so that's what we'll talk about here. We'll talk about auctions from the perspective of the person who's selling the thing off. And if you're selling the thing off you want to think about how can I make as much money as I possibly can. So we're going to talk about these three types of auctions. Ascending bid, second price, and sealed bid. Now again, an ascending bid is an auction where we just keep calling out prices until no one wants to stay in anymore. A second price auction is a sealed auction where each person writes down an amount. The highest bid gets it, but they get it at the second highest bid. Okay, So it's sort of complicated. So the highest bidder wins the good, but they only pay the second highest bid. And then finally, a sealed bid auction is everybody submits a bid and the highest bidder gets it, but they pay it at the amount that they bid. Okay, so let's start with the sending bid auction. Sending bid auctions are pretty simple. Individuals keep calling out bids or there's an auctioneer until no one is willing to go above a price and whoever's bid the highest price gets it. So let's think about how that would work. Now when I think about how that would work, we've got to think about different types of behavioral models. Remember we said there's sort of three ways we can think about modeling people. One is we can think of people being rational. The other is we can think of people following psychological rules, having maybe some biases. And the third thing, we can think about people being rule following, having some sort of heuristic or rule of thumb that they use in different situations. So if we think about an ascending bid auction where somebody keeps calling out price, if I'm rational, I'm gonna, if I've got some value, if it's worth $100 to me, I'm going to keep bidding until it gets up to $100. You know, if it's, so if it's going to sell for 90 and it's worth 100 to me, then I'll bid 91. So I'll bid pretty much up to my value. What about these other two? What about psychological or rule following in this setting? Let's first do rule following. In this setting, a rule following bidder might have some rule like I'm going to start out at half my value and then I'm going to go up by five dollars or two dollars. They might have some you know, fairly sophisticated heuristic about how they raise their bids. But at the end of the day, it seems like they're probably only going to bid up to their value. They wouldn't bid above their value because then they're paying more than it's worth to them. And they probably wouldn't stop bidding at less than their value. However, the rule could determine how much they raise bids by and things like that. Now for a psychological bidder, here a bunch of things could come in. It could be that their initial bid is based on how much the previous goods sold for or all sorts of things. But again, it's hard to imagine in this ascending bid auction someone not bidding for something if it was going to sell for less than they wanted it for. It's also hard to imagine someone bidding more than they value something for. Well, maybe that's not, not that hard because you can imagine in, a, in an ascending bid auction that people could get in a frenzy. They could really want to win. So even though something's valued at $100, to them, it might be that if they're winning it at 95 and then somebody else bids 105, that they bid 110 just for the, you know, just for the thrill of winning. Once I was, I was talking to a real auctioneer recently at a charity auction, and he said that he feels he can raise the amount of money, increase the amount of money that you get because he gets people all excited and they get excited about winning and they forget that even though they only want that base for $100, they'll pay $150 just for the thrill of winning, for the thrill of the chase. So psychological models in this setting could actually lead to higher values. But let's start out by assuming that people are rational. So what's the outcome in an ascending bid auction? The good just goes to whoever bid the most. So fairly straightforward. How much is that person going to pay? Well, they're probably going to pay the value of the second highest bidder. Why is that? Because let's suppose that one person values at 100 and another person values at 70. So it starts out the bidding is at 40 and then 50 and then 60 and at 70. And at 70 this person's going to drop out. So this person who values at 100 shouldn't pay any more than 70. Yeah, they could make a mistake. If, they, if their rule is to keep incrementing by 10, they could pay 80. But most of the time you'd expect them to pay only a little bit over 70. Only a little bit over the value of the second highest bidder. Okay, now let's look at a second price auction. Totally different auction mechanism and we can compare the two. In a second price auction, everybody writes down a bid. Whoever has the highest bid gets it, but you pay the second highest price. 
So let's suppose there's three bidders. One bidder values it at, one puts in 90, one puts in 60, one puts at 70. So the winner is the one that bids 90, but they only pay 70 because they pay the second highest price. Totally straightforward. Well, let's think about how you'd bid in this setting. You could be a rational bidder, a psychological bidder, a rule following bidder. Let's focus on the rational bidder to start. Let's think about how would you rationally bid in this setting. So let's suppose your value is 80. And let's for a moment suppose you bid your true value, bid 80. But all we care about is the highest other bid. So if the highest other bid is 60 and you bid 80, you're going to get it, right? You're going to pay 60. So you're going to end up winning, in a sense, $20 because you paid 60 and it was worth 80. Suppose the highest other bid is 75. If you bid 80, you get it, you pay 75, and so your net gain is going to be 5. Well, let's suppose the highest other bid is 85, so you're no longer the highest bid. That means somebody else is going to get it, they're going to pay 80, you don't get it, so your value is 0. So your values are 25 and 0. Well, let's suppose you think, maybe I should bid a little bit more. Maybe I should bid 90. Well, if you bid 90 and the highest other bid is 60, you're going to get it for 60, and so your net is going to be 20. Now why 20? 20 because you value it at 80 and you paid 60. So bidding 90 didn't hurt you any. You know, the fact that you bid 10 over your bid, your real value didn't cost you at all. Well, suppose the highest other bid is 75. Again, you bid 90, but you only pay 75, and so your net is 5 just as it was before. But suppose the, second, the highest other bid is 85 and now you bid 90. Well, now you're going to pay 85. You only value it at 80, so you're going to lose 5. Notice you're worse off than you were before, because before, in that case, you didn't lose anything, and here you lose 5. So it's fairly clear in a second price auction you don't want to overbid. But do you want to underbid? Suppose you bid 70, highest other bid is 60, you're going to get it for 60, so your net is going to be 20. But if the second highest bid is 75, and you bid 70, then you're not going to get it, because they're going to get it, and they're only going to pay 70, and you're going to say, oh, I wish I'd have bid 80, or at least 76. So you're only going to get zero, whereas if you would have bid 80, you'd have gotten it for 75 and you'd have made $5. And finally, if the other highest other bid is 85, you're not going to get it anyway and your payoff is zero. So what we see in the second price auction is if you tell the truth, you get 25 zero. If you overbid, you get 25 minus 5. And if you underbid, you get 20 zero zero. So the rational bidder in this case should bid your true value. What about the other types of bidders? What if you're a rule following bidder? Well, the rule-following bidder here could do a lot of things. The rule-following bidder could have say, well, maybe I'm going to shade my bid 10%, or they could overbid. It's hard to tell. So a rule-following bidder may not play the optimal rule. They could, play, they could overbid or underbid. A psychological bidder as well, there's just going to be more variation. We don't know if people are going to tell the truth or not. But the interesting thing about this auction is, is that whether or not the other people are irrational or not, it's still optimal for you if you're rational, to bid your true value. So the interesting thing here is there's no sort of ratcheting up. Remember when we did that race to the bottom game? If other people were irrational, then you wanted to start taking into account their irrationality? The interesting thing here in the second price auction is even if other people are psychological or other people are rule-based, you should still bid your true value. So what that's going to mean is that's going to lead to a general tendency towards people being more rational. That doesn't mean we have to abandon the psychological and rule-following um, rules for thinking about how people behave. But it does mean that there's probably these general tendencies for people, over time at least, to make rational bids. So let's think about this for a second. What happens in this auction? The outcome goes to the highest valued bidder, and that person pays the second highest price. That's the exact same thing we got in the ascending bid auction. Okay, now let's go to the sealed bid auction. This is, in some ways, even though the simplest, it's the most complicated. So now everybody puts in a bid, they're all sealed, and the highest bidder gets it, but they pay the highest price. So if there's three bidders, bidder 1 bids 90, bidder 2 bids 60, bidder 3 bids 70, bidder 1 gets it at 90, but, they, but she pays 90. She doesn't pay 70, she pays 90. So in this setting, it makes sense to do what? To shade, to bid a little bit less. So if we think about what a rational bidder should do, that person should probably shade a little bit. If we think about a psychological bidder, that person might also shade, but they might think, well, other people are going to bid even numbers like 75, so I'm going to bid $75.01. Now, a rule-following bidder, in this case, might shade by some fixed percentage. So if we think about a rational bidder, how they should bid, it's going to depend on a bunch of things, including the number of other people in the auction. Let's look at a simple case 
where there's just two. Now one thing we know right away is the higher you bid, the more likely it is you're going to win. So you want to shade, you want to go under your value, but you also want to get, you know, somewhat higher bids because then you're more likely to win. So you want to think through how this logic plays out. So let's do a two bidder model. And let's suppose the value of the other bidder is a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. So remember, the uniform distribution is equally likely to be, be any value between 0 and 1. Let's suppose the other bidder bids her true value. So if she bids her true value, what are the odds that you win if you bid 60 cents? Well, you're going to win if her value happens to be less than 60 cents, and that's going to happen 60% of the time. We can generalize this. Suppose you bid some amount B, which is between 0 and 1. What are the odds that you win? Well, again, you're probably the, the odds that you win is just going to be B. So let's formalize this. Let's suppose the other person's bidding her true value. And think about what you should bid. So V is your value, B is your bid. V minus B is your surplus. That's how much you'd win if you win. So if, if your value was 90 and your bid was 30, then you won, you'd get 60, right? That's how much you sort of, it's the difference between your value for the object and how much you bid. In this case, though, these values are going to be in the interval 0, 1, as are your bids. Now, B, if you bid 0.6, is also your probability of winning. So if you bid a half, the probability of winning is a half. If you build a quarter, the probability of winning is a quarter. So your expected winnings are just your probability of winning times your surplus. So that's just B times V minus B. So all you want to do is maximize B times V minus B. Well, if I multiply that out, it's B V minus B squared. Now, if you've had calculus, all I have to do is take the derivative of this with respect to B, and that's going to give you V minus 2B equals 0, which we've got right here, and your optimal bid is to bid half your value. So if you think the other person's bidding her true value, you should bid half your value. And so let's think about this for a second. So you're a rational bidder, and you think, if the other person's bidding her true value, I should bid half my value. But that means the other person should probably also be bidding half of her value. If I'm bidding half my value and I'm rational, she should be bidding half her value. So let's think through it. Let's suppose she's bidding half her value. What should you do? If the other bidder bids half her value, now if I bid B, the probability that I win is going to be 2B. Why is that? Let's think about it. So suppose that I bid 0.25. If I bid 0.25, I'm going to win as long as her value is less than 0.25 times 2 because she's bidding half her value. So that means I'm going to win half the time. So what we get is the probability that I win if I bid B is going to be 2B given that she's bidding half her value. So now we just do the same calculation. V is my value, B is my bid, so the difference between those two is how much I win. And now 2b is my probability of winning. So my winnings are going to be 2b times v minus b. So if I write down that and set the derivative again equal to 0, what I'm going to get is that I again should bid v over 2. Now if you don't know how to take derivatives, don't worry about it. All we're doing here is we're just using a little math to show that my optimal bid again is going to be v over 2. Well, this is great because it says if I bid half my value and she bids half her value, we're both doing the optimal thing. So the optimal thing for each of us in this case, the rational thing to do, would be to bid half our value. So what's going to happen is the highest value bidder is going to get it, and they're going to get it at half their value. Great. So let's look through all three of our auctions. In the sealed bid auction, the highest bidder gets it at half her value. In the ascending bid auction, the highest value bidder gets it at the second highest value. And at the second price auction, the highest value bidder gets it also at the second highest value. But notice this though, half of the highest bidder's value, if the highest bidder's value was 60, half of their value is 30, that's the expected value of the second highest bidder. Why is that? Well, remember, let's think about it. We've got this distribution of values and they're uniform. So if I bid 0.6 and I win, that means that the other person's bid is somewhere in here. So what's if it's somewhere in there, the expected value of that would be halfway in between, which would be my bid over 2. So half of my value, if I've got a uniform distribution, is exactly equal to the expected value of the second highest bidder. So what we get is all three of these auctions seem to work about the same way. The highest value bidder gets it, and they get it at either the exact value of the second highest bidder 
or at the expected value of the second highest bidder. And since if you're auctioning it off, you don't know the exact value of the second highest bidder, all you can expect to get is the expected value of the second highest bidder. So it looks like all three of these things are the same. And in fact, they are. So there's a theorem proven by Roger Meyerson, and he, incidentally, he won a Nobel Prize for this work, so it's a fairly sophisticated theorem, that says if you have rational bidders, there's a wide class of auction mechanisms that includes sealed bids, second price, and ascending bid auctions, such that they get identical expected outcomes. So the expected outcomes in all three of those cases were highest bidder gets it at the expected value of the second highest bidder. And that's what we got, and it's called the revenue equivalence theorem. So what the model tells us is it doesn't matter how we auction things off if voters are rational. So this is a really powerful theorem, and here we see the value, one of the values of models. Because we might sit around and think, oh boy, ascending bid auctions are better, sealed bid auctions are better, second price auctions are better. What this tells us is, if we have rational bidders, all three are equally good. But we may not have rational bidders. We could have psychological bidders. We could have rule-following bidders. So here's where we take our model results, the revenue equivalence theorem, and we then try and bring our experience in and think something about the bidders in the auction. So let's suppose we've got a whole bunch of really sophisticated bidders. So these are multinational firms bidding on oil leases. Well, in that case, we can imagine that they're probably fairly close to rational. And now we know that pretty much any auction mechanism is going to give us the same revenue. And so we could say, well, maybe it doesn't matter. Well, now we may care about things like transparency. So for instance, maybe we decide to have it be a sealed bid auction so we can actually see exactly how much people bid. And we know that none of the, since the, all the bidders are highly rational, it's going to be okay. We're going to get the same revenue, and that way we'll see it. Let's suppose instead we're having some charity auction, we're auctioning off um, something in the community just for fun. And now we know people maybe haven't participated in an auction before, and it's somewhat confusing to them. And they may be suffering from some psychological biases, or they may just be following some simple rules. Well, in those settings, when you've got unsophisticated bidders, let's think about the three auctions. In the sealed bid auction, they've got to think about what are the distribution of other people's values. Well, that could be really hard for them to do, and they may make all sorts of mistakes. They may follow rules that don't make sense. They may suffer from psychological biases. What about the second price auction, where you say, okay, the highest bidder gets it at the second highest price? That may be confusing to people, and they might not have any idea how it works. So what about the ascending bid auction? Well, this makes a lot of sense in that setting because even if people are biased or if they're rule following, it's still probably going to be the case that if it's worth, if the bid is lower than what they value it, that they'll probably bid. So that way, no one's going to do some silly thing and underbid and not get something they want. And in addition, if we're trying to make as much money as we can, given that there could be some psychological bias in that people could just want to win, we might even make more money by having an ascending bid auction. We're not going to make more money in the sealed bid case. So what we see is if we have highly sophisticated people, maybe we go with sealed bid, or maybe we go with second price because they can figure it out. If we've got unsophisticated people, maybe we go with ascending bid for a couple of reasons. One, it's easier, and the other is maybe we get them sort of in a psychological frenzy and we make more money. We have a powerful theorem, the revenue equivalence theorem, and that tells us it doesn't matter which auction mechanism we, do, we use if people are rational. But if we think about how people actually behave, we can then start to make some distinctions about what institution to auction things off might work best. And in some cases, we might want sealed bid. And in some cases, we might want ascending. And in other cases, we might want second price. So what we've seen here is we can write down models of auctions. And we can develop some really profound results saying that it doesn't matter how you auction things off, provided some conditions are met. So that's really nice. It sort of frees us up to think about other things. And it frees us up to think about how are people actually going to behave? How much information do they have? How sophisticated are they? How many of them are there? And that can then, then we can use those criteria to decide which auctions we're going to use, as opposed to spending our time thinking about, well, this auction is better than this auction on purely rational grounds. So when we talked about what, why do we model? Why do we assume even rational actors? Remember I said benchmarks are good things. Remember I said Roger Meyerson says, the one who's got the revenue equivalence theorem, that assuming rational behavior is often a very good benchmark. Well, we saw that was the case here in auctions, because we see if, if people are rational, doesn't matter what mechanism you use. Once we relax that assumption, then the mechanism may matter. But now we know what criteria to use to think about choosing among auction mechanisms. So it's really useful. Models are really helpful. 
All right. Thank you.